I'm David Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. This episode is going to cover the predatory mite, Neocelus phalasis. So few people have heard about phalasis, and it's just, it's a bug that's not carried by some of the largest producers. Um, and the reason for it is because it goes in at such a low application rate and very early in the crop and doesn't really typically need any reapplication. So it's good for you but bad for the business of producing and selling these bugs. So it's why it's kind of been swept under, under the rug and you hear names probably like Swirskii and Californicus. And in fact, Californicus is probably the closest exam, uh, closest relative of, of Phalasis in terms of what it can do. The difference is, and something that you would be interested in, is that Phalasis' application rate can be as low as two mites per square meter. So when you start, regardless of what the cost is that it, that it might set you back, you're going to find it's way less expensive ultimately than Californicus because you need just so much less. And it eats all the same things. In fact, it's probably better in a, in a lot of cases. It's a bit more voracious of a predator. Phalasis is a, is a tiny mite, so if you're familiar already with some of the ones I've, I've talked about using in the garden, like Stradiolelaps, for example, it's a mite where you can kind of dump out the package onto, onto a table and, and see it fairly effectively uh, just walking around. And Phalasis is about half the size of that, so some people will really struggle to, to see it. And the food mite that it's packaged with is roughly the same size. And before you think that that's weird, it, Food for predatory mites can always be bigger because it's their toxic bite and how aggressive they are it, with their need to feed that they can usually take down these big guys and, and feed on them. Which is why when you look at the statistics of a lot of these guys, they might feed on one prey a day. And that's because they are so substantial. You're sitting there eating a thrips larva for a day, you, you won't be hungry for a little while. Whereas something like spider mite eggs, they might go through a whole ton. So remember Phalasis next time you need to get a mite to control any sort of pest that you're after. But remember, it's a spider mite predator for sure. Like it will control your spider mite. It can help with aerophyid mites and tarsinibid mites. It is the only control for bamboo mite. While some of them might eat it in a petri dish, it is the only one that can go through the tight cocoon of the bamboo mite. So it really is your bamboo mite control. Anything in um, with cane fruit, like it controls the spider mites that affect raspberries in particular, but also the red berry mite, which turns some of the berries, like blackberries, the ones that don't ripen, the little bits of the fruit that don't ripen and stay pink. Uh, that's from a little uh, tarsinibid mite, I believe, or aerophyid mite. Uh, that's also you, that's also controlled with phalasis. Um, it may help with your thrips control. It may help with your white fly control. Remember, they all eat white fly eggs. It's not just Swirskii. In fact, the study that proved Swirskii was a white fly predator proved that they all ate them. Even the control of Persimilis, which only eats two spotted spider mite, ate ten percent of the white fly eggs in that trial. So they all do. And now, while phalasis was found in an orchard that had been heavily sprayed. Uh, to try to get rid of an invasive invasive pest, it was it was immediately known uh, to have a lot of resistance to chemicals. And as it's got bred over generations and generations, no, it's not it's not necessarily true. So don't go and spray this one just because I've said that it had some chemical resistance to it. Uh, it's still those programs. Whenever somebody says that those programs are interchangeable, predatory insects and mites and chemical pesticides. They're not. They're just saying that it's not immediately lethal to them, but they'll always say, if it does hurt them, you just gotta buy more. So always avoid that anyway. So even soaps and detergents, anything like that, it just smothers them. Uh, the plant becomes unsuitable for predators. It just doesn't work. So remember, do not use 
any sort of chemical intervention with your biocontrols unless you plan on resetting your biocontrol program after the chemicals have worn off. And in some cases, that's a day. In some cases, that's weeks. In some cases, that's the life of the plant. So be very careful. And I don't just mean off the shelf chemicals. I mean, under your cupboard soaps, acids, bases, that sort of stuff has lasting effects on plants. But phyllosis has been established for a long time. It's gone into arborvitae or sort of evergreen uh, shrub companies. Um, and it's really helped them get cut down a miticide for spider mite or something like that and, uh, get, and get better product because the plants actually do suffer from a lot of the pesticides that we use. You just don't really notice it unless you do a side-by-side long-term trial like you did. For example, one of the big growers in Oregon switched from miticide use uh, to phyllosis at two mites per square meter, which eventually ended up spreading all through their site anyways, and they've never had to reapply it. And their arborvitaes went from being ready for sale at seven years to five years. So not only did they cut down on the savings from having to use the miticide, which included the staff, uh, the spraying equipment and the chemical itself, but they also ended up with this huge amount of more space in order to dedicate that to more plants or a different kind of plant. There are a few drawbacks and one is that it was found in Ontario. So when it comes to October and the nights are getting cold and the day length is short, it will want to diapause and that's how it naturally survives an Ontario winter. Most of us just leave. However, phyllosis is usually used indoors anyways and simple things like additional lights and heat, which is probably in place anyways, is enough to kind of trick it. So it's sort of a mute point. A very obvious application for phyllosis in the yard is here in my strawberry bed. So strawberries are prone to thrips and thrips cause all sorts of problems. First of all, this can be a breeding ground for them to go elsewhere as well. But importantly is they can deform the fruit by, inf by attacking the flower. So right now it's, it's May in the garden and I'm looking at a, a ton of strawberry flowers. So it's right now where I can already see the odd thrip inside the flower head. When it does the damage, which is, which is its, um, its mouthpiece can deform the flower because of some of the toxins that are involved, then the fruit itself gets that misshapen um, look to it. So I'm going to apply phyllosis every spring in this garden and this time of year in order to knock down that thrips population. So keep in mind, it's not typically sold as a thrips predator, um, a thrips control because if this was midsummer and and i was seeing thrips all over the place and when most people recognize thrips in the garden um, it's too late for phyllosis because i'm putting this in at two mites per square meter that's not enough to combat a massive th thrips infestation it is an, enough to combat the thrips that are here now prevent them from multiplying and and preventing that early fruit damage the application in a bed like this is easy. I could take the care to put a little bit of the phyllosis in its carrier just on a bunch of the plants as I go along, but it's just as easy to dump some in your hand and just kind of hand broadcast it like that. Um, they're light, they're gonna fall everywhere, but it doesn't matter. Even if I just put them on this plant, they're gonna very quickly start moving off to some of the other plants wherever there's food available. And there's other pests for them as well. In a dry spell, you'll get spider mite on a crop like strawberries. Um, it's not a big deal this time of year, obviously, but there's a bunch of other mites kicking around as well um, and other pests. Raspberries, blackberries, any cane fruit like this in that family in particular, it's going to be prone to spider mites um, as well as the red berry mite. Phyllosis goes on here as well. This one's even easier. One method that's often employed, especially um, a good example would be when a nursery contacts us and they've got a, a spider mite problem or they have a problem where they've already decided that they want phyllosis. Now that two mites per square meter is of course a preventative application rate, but in some cases they need much more to combat a problem that already exists. Now the cost of inoculating um, acres of, of property in some cases with phyllosis might be cost prohibitive and in those cases one of the options that's provided is to do the perimeter so in places like behind me with a with a cedar hedge or arborvitae hedge sometimes what we'll do is instead we'll we'll use a smaller amount and we'll apply it around 
plants like that, very strategically placed plants where we know that spider mite will overwinter, we know that spider mites already there, we know that they will establish permanently, and that way they can kind of spread out into the yard. So it's not that one's not a quick fix, but that's a cost effective way of inoculating a large yard, and that can be done in your backyard as well. So I encourage you to look up Phalasis. It, it shouldn't be this forgotten mite. It's going to save you money. It's, it's a far better application indoors because of the longevity, that it's proven longevity on plants, even in drier indoor conditions, as long as the plant is healthy and it can kind of find humidity underneath the leaves. Okay, that's it for this episode of Gardening with Bugs. I hope you enjoyed. Please subscribe and uh, hit like and uh, stay tuned for more.